warming video. It's been so long. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Okay. It's a lovely winter's day that feels like a summer's day. We're just in the sweet spot of Isn't global it climate 50 change. Today? Yesterday yeah. it was 50 and it snuck up on me because I had just mentally already gone to the dark place and was like, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're avoiding outside as much as possible. It's the end of the year and we are technically an ex woman channel. One of the top six ex woman channels, according to. Did you see that reel? Oh, yeah, yeah. By yeah, that yeah, Mormon guy that was like, I analyzed the six channels that are biggest that are negative about the church. And they're all obsessed with the CES letter. And then the clip was the one with Jared, where we made him read the CES letter for the first time. Mm -hmm. And Jared was like, oh no, I featured in an ex Mormon video. Oh, this is so <laughs> weird. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. And it's funny because, like, in that video, we barely even take the CES as seriously. We're just like shooting the shit. Jared I know, I'm like, nothing. that's so 2015. I know. We're fully into clay now. Anyway, it's the end of the year. We are an ex Mormon channel. We don't like to stay fully abreast of Mormonism throughout the year. Like we're not as on top of it as we used to be, but we do take interest, I feel like, in the bigger things and kind of the larger phenomena that are happening. So I asked on Reddit what everyone there thought the most harmful talk or teaching, I suppose, of 2023 was. I said I was specifically curious to hear from people who had sort of Mormon friends and family members who like their treatment of them changed in response to these talks, which is a very common thing in Mormonism. Like there will be marked differences in how members will treat their ex-woman loved ones right after general conference because mm -hmm. that's like the whole religion, right? Is like listen to the guys in charge. <laughs> and nobody else. There is no other side. Which, uh, I don't know if this- Ethical organizations are always saying that, right? Well, <laughs> don't look, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. You're it's... saying it as like a, a joke, but the, Russell M. Nelson, the prophet of the church, did actually say this year, never take counsel from those who do not believe, which is basically just like, don't listen to anyone who's not one of us. <laughs> so it's not even a joke. They just openly say it. But I think that actually might be from the talk we're reading today. So. Everyone yeah. said, spoiler alert, that the Think Celestial talk that the prophet of the Mormon Church, Russell M. Nelson, gave was the most harmful. I think for just a plethora of reasons, which we're about to find out. It cannot be overstated that this man is 99. Um, it will be September next year that he'll turn 100. So we'll see if he makes it. That would be sick. Why do the Mormon leaders live so long? Do you think it's because... Because they don't drink coffee. And do you think having sort of a religious cause the way that they do, and I'm sure they also have amazing healthcare and all that, and access to the best stuff in the world, but... I mean, he's a, sur he's a heart surgeon for crime and he... He does himself. He has <laughs> yeah. a problem. I think he actually did operate on himself Shut at one point. Up. Oh, gotcha. please don't tell me I just invented a Mormon legend that's not real. That could be a, a fake story. That could be Okay, a if anyone knows where the Russell M. Nelson... <laughs> President Russell M. Nelson has ever performed open heart surgery on himself, drop that in the comments <laughs> and we'll circle back to it in 2024, Anytime. probably. So we're going to watch the talk now. It's 19 minutes long. Yeehaw, buckle up. I get orders of business are actually that we are currently trying to fundraise to be able to keep the channel going in 2024. So if you're interested in supporting us, which would make us so grateful, there are the options to do so in the description box. Once you see these guys as just like, normal old guys who are good at playing nice on TV, like mm -hmm. good and wise on TV, the veneer that you, that they shown in before is that it is like that, like curtain mm -hmm. being drawn back experience and just being like, Oh, this is how the mm -hmm. sausage is made. You're just like an old guy. You're just like us like, for real. <laughs> yeah. Like, and you read a teleprompter. Yeah. I'm good at reading a tele. We have the same job. But just reads of a teleprompter <laughs> confidently. <laughs> But he has to convince 16 million people that he's ham and, mm. having ham and cheese sandwiches with Jesus every Thursday. Without saying it, because, you know, he's not. Jesus loves ham, <laughs> you just know it. Can Jews eat ham? Uh, no. Jesus probably never had ham. Jesus probably never had ham. But he loves sausage. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hear from a normal guy who is not in cahoots with Jesus trying to convince you that he's in cahoots with Jesus, that his just like normal day-to-day -day psychological operations are superior to everybody else's mm -hmm. because he happened to inherit the uh, uh, or corporation soul of the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is why we need an A24 series on this because it's, it is a normal guy 
who goes about his day being treated like he's the single most important man on planet Earth. Yeah. That would be an amazing show. Did you see the uh, walk around like David Bednar does, like, follow an apostle around? And I was like, it's just him. <laughs> he's, like, going into Bath and Body Works, like, come on, it's 33 <laughs> right now. And then he's like, oh, I love salty caramel. <laughs> it's just him, like, walk walking from, like, fluorescent lit... To, like cubicle to fluorescent lit cubicle. And I'm like, oh, just Pure, the nothing but liminal like, space with that man. Yeah. <laughs> if liminal space was a man, <laughs> every time he talks, you're kind of just like suspended awkwardly. <laughs> Do the thing where we create space for the video. Yes, create space for the prophet of God. <laughs> I love how the idea of like, I used to walk around as a missionary and be like, man, wouldn't if you knew that there was a person on the earth today, like Noah, like Peter, like uh, Habakkuk, <laughs> wouldn't you want to know what he had to say? And I just thought that that would like thrill people and they'd be like, yes, please tell me what he wants to What's say. And then I'd be like, um, he's saying, don't look into church history. <laughs> Yeah, and like, only believe our group. Like, that's compelling. You uh, better pay up or you won't see your family. That's like, with all that's going on in the world, like, once you, like, are exposed to just mm -hmm. a little bit of philosophy, a little mm -hmm. bit of, like, good literature, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, this is like eating porridge and being like, this is the best meal I ever had in my whole life. Mm -hmm. But it's my fault because I'm but very wicked and very evil and such a vile sinner that I'm just lucky that this church has saved me through Christ. And I've heard you say that authentically as Little Orphan Townley about <laughs> so many bowls of porridge. It's his favorite food, <laughs> unironically. Really. He like becomes wealthy and still has it every day. He's got a porridge line now. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make doing YouTube sustainable because it's not. It's not. But we should start <laughs> threatening people below. that if if they don't give us ten percent of their income, we we this is something that like critics of ex Mormons and us specifically will be like giving your money to these people, like, oh, I can't believe they're asking for donations. And it's like, the church, we're literally just entertainers who are talking about like a shared experience and our perspective on the world. And if that's valuable to people, they can send us money. Meanwhile, the church is literally like, if you don't give us 10% of your money, you will burn alive at the second coming. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to see your family for fucking eternity. Give us 10% or else. Mm -hmm. Like, and we, levels of manipulation. we got our so-called communications degrees at, that, at these guys' university. Like, we gave them money to indoctrinate us. <laughs> so you get what you fucking ask for, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Brothers and sisters, I am deeply grateful to speak with you today. At my age, each new day brings wonderful as well as challenging surprises. He is literally giving Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate cult yeah. that all committed yeah. suicide together. Thankfully, he just has a shit ton more money than that cult and doesn't need to be as drastic. Yeah. Literally, that like, yeah, same I'm vibe. Watch his, watch Marshall Applewhite's like recruit videos that he sent out mm -hmm. where he's just like, uh, this, we have a message from the divine. It's like that same confidence, that same spellbind and mesmerize and high gaze, mm -hmm. that same tone of voice. It is hypnosis. I've said this in a recent video, but Stephen Hassan, who created the bike model cult leader, freedom from mind control guy, said the one thing that is kind of like, when I asked him what I should learn more about to understand cults better, he said, hypnosis. They're all using hypnosis way more than you think. And it's so true. Like, what are these conferences? But like, aren't they like 12 hours in total with all the sessions? But whatever, like 10 hour hypnosis weekends twice a Where year. Where you're like on borderline sleep the yeah, whole time. Yeah, there's a reason people, even <laughs> the people who are so righteous, who love general conference so much, who got a great night's sleep, but you fall asleep during this because it's this specific style that like just hasn't modernized because it works for its intended purpose, which is to just kind of like lull you into like- Carnal security. It's kind of peaceful. It's like, don't do anything that would rock the boat. That would be terrible. Peace is right here. Yeah. Oof. Three weeks ago, I injured the muscles of my back. So while I have delivered more than 100 general conference addresses standing, Today, I thought I would do so sitting. It's generally been a thing in the Mormon church that they have to believe the prophet is superhuman, right? That's why even when prophets have gone into like cognitive decline, they've just propped them. They've done a kind of a weekend at Bernie situation with so many of them. I don't know. I'm just like 99 is amazing. Like yeah. that, honestly, the power of the priesthood can maybe have that one because 
like you've already done it. You've mm-hmm. made it. Sit forever. I like to believe he wrote the joke himself. I just hope that he was the kind of surgeon with just that kind of bedside manner. Sadly, I wasn't even able to see it as a joke. I just literally was like, it's an order of business that has to be brought up. Because if he doesn't acknowledge it, they'll be stirring. <laughs> I thought it was a joke because these guys know that they can give the most softball yeah. <laughs> yeah. thwack and everyone will be like, he is literally the funniest person. He yeah. should do stand up. Yeah. <laughs> I pray that the Spirit will carry my message into your hearts today. He's also just very clearly reading from a teleprompter. I recently celebrated my 99th birthday and thus commenced my 100th year of living. I'm often asked the secret to living so long. A better question would be, what have I learned in nearly a century of living? No, it's sweet potatoes he's lying. He doesn't want us to know because they have stock in Big Pharma. Beans, berries. Mm -hmm. You can't beat the antioxidants or the fiber. Very long pauses in between sections, huh? Fair. If I'm listening to a 99-year-old man, I don't expect him to talk at my pace, you know? Yeah, they're not doing the YouTube jump cut. No, but something to really think about because this whole thing could be an email. Time today does not allow me to answer that question fully. But may I share one of the most crucial lessons I have learned? I have learned that Heavenly Father's plan for us is fabulous. It's fabulous! (laughs) Of course you have, but didn't you know that from when you were like three? I'm like, like, so you learned nothing. Yeah. You, you, You learned one lesson at the beginning. You were raised being told that. You've lived a human life that doesn't really seem like it's been any more fa- in fact I would say quite like less fabulous well like, no I mean he's lived a life of luxury and privilege been able to eh, become yeah, a surgeon true. had the means and ability to do that and then was able to be successful enough and closely connected enough mm-hmm. to rise to the hierarchy of an organization built around worshipping him and which is pretty yeah, cool <laughs> you can't put a price on status honestly but the outfits have been so bad the whole time I'm like name one time you felt fabulous <laughs> I love that he chose that word specifically Fabulous, like, yeah, I know. A, a man notorious for doing homophobia. Try- no, it's because they're trying to get back the fucking uh, LGBTQ people they've lost. Uh, they're like, just trying to... <laughs> that's my mom's like soft allyship is using the word fa- ally, uh, a little bit of fabulous. Yeah. Uh-huh. She, the people be like, she'll be like, have a fabulous day. And they're like, mm-hmm. oh, thank you, I will. That what we do in this life really matters. And that the Savior's atonement is what makes our father's plan possible. All right, time to go to 1.25. Our father was really bad at planning. I'm just going to say if a third of your children are like, dude, I would rather just like be in hell forever than deal with this thing. You as like a parent might be like, oh, maybe I can learn something from the next generation. If a third of my children, I'm just like, uh, I'm going to burn you in hell for fucking ever over Mm -hmm. this. If you're the all knowing creator who knew them even before you made them, like maybe run that through a couple more tests. Genuinely, what is the difference? Like the big crime Satan committing was like, he was going to get us all to heaven but it would be like forced i mean that's that's one interpretation it just says that he was trying to destroy our agency so some people took that as and what agency do you have when it's like if you do these things you'll burn in hell it's the type of agency like (laughs) someone holding a gun to your head and being like give me do you consent to giving me your wallet or i shoot you no kevin (laughs) i don't that's when we practice good boundaries (laughs) which is uh uh just why the lds church is fundamentally manipulative because it uses that type of relationshiping with its members. Nothing, Mm -hmm. it's not done just out of love, Christ-like love or compassion. It's all through guilt and through threats and through holding your family and your eternal mansion hostage. As I have wrestled with the intense pain caused by my recent injury, I felt even deeper appreciation for Jesus Christ. And opioids. Sensible gift of his atonement think of it just an immediate diversion away from the thing that's actually helping you have relief after you've broken your back like medical care scientists you know it's never that crazy that he as a surgeon just literally does not believe in evolution not fussed when did he go to school like the 40s i mean yeah (laughs) and it was probably not taught even among science people the savior suffered 
pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. Feels like a lot of the time Mormons aren't, don't feel able to just connect to their own pain and send love to it. So they have to like transfer it onto this external imaginary figure, Jesus. I mean, not imaginary per se. You get a saying. conceptual yep. figure. And then they're like, oh, I mean, I feel so grateful because Jesus, like everything just gets transferred onto Jesus instead of like, oh, I'm a human being right now and I'm in pain and like just kind of like honoring that and sitting with that. And then I'm also great, so grateful for all these ways that I have it easier than others. And, uh, and in fact, I should be guilty that I'm not more yeah. grateful and oh my God, I need to be even more uh, diligent in my support of this organization because Jesus yeah. did so. It's the it's like Catholic guilt. I mean, that's why they got the crucified Christ right there in the mm. middle of it. It's like, how fucking dare you choose to have a life, do anything of your own volition, knowing that Jesus fucking went through this shit. With those abs, after 40 <laughs> days of fasting, I'm still thinking about it. It just feels like such an unnecessary distortion of something that could just be perfectly normal and healthy. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like a bastardization of the emotional processing process. But he can comfort us, heal us, rescue us in times of need. Jesus Christ described his experience in Gethsemane and on Calvary. Quote. Again, this, the Savior thing, it really is, because it's an externalized concept, that concept can be manipulated by the church. Mm -hmm. That is the function. I know that it's, there's more to it than that, and there's going to be Christians who are like, no, my thing is personal, it has nothing to do. I get that. The LDS church is using it for that. <laughs> and, yeah. and making people so that they can't, because ultimately, when someone gets through a hard, a hard thing, they're like, I know I couldn't have done this without the help of Jesus. But the reality is that you would have, and you Actually did, could. and that people do every single day. Even what you're summoning from Jesus is still coming from the chemical, neurochemical processes of your own body. And what becoming like a sovereign adult human being involves is learning how to generate that and to... Uh, Carve out that safe space in your heart, that inner sanctuary of peace. Where th we talked about this recently with um, Stephanie, Stephanie Brinkerhoff um, of becoming that sanctuary for yourself so that mm -hmm. you can uh, recognize where that support is coming from. Mm -hmm. Because these people are doing it anyway. They're just using this concept yeah. as their way of getting through that. But you, there's lots of concepts that people can use to get through things. Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore, close quote. My injury has caused me to reflect again and again on the greatness of the Holy One of Israel. Oh, <laughs> niche. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when I stub my foot, it causes me to reflect <laughs> on the Greek god Poseidon and I'm just like, <laughs> thank God he rules the ocean, really, when you think about it. Okay, I don't want to be like ableist and condescending, but, or ageist either, but as someone who's had, had family members, you know, in my genetic line, suffer from cognitive decline. It's a normal part of aging. It to is suffer a normal cognitive part of decline. aging and like the inability to differentiate between reality and dream and memory yeah. sometimes become But it was muddled. baked in him like, he stood no chance even at his most neuroplastic years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying he may be having, like, a rocking oh, trip right now yeah. where he's, like, Especially all his delusions are just like, back. oh, yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> I do wonder what his, uh... His current medicinal cabinet is looking like these days. Like How it. much modern medicine has intervened on yeah. his behalf where the priesthood may have left wide gaps. <laughs> I want a medicine cabinet tour from this man. If the PR department gave a shit about captivating the youth. Also, can we really quick talk about how the church, which claims to be, you know, the kingdom of God on the earth that will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ as the bride sent to receive the bridegroom. And yet when you look at where they've generated all their billions of dollars, it's like, uh, weapons manufacturing mm. and, mm. uh, big pharma mm. and, you know, among other things as well. But it's like, are they really, are we fixing it? Or are we just, you know, getting money from all the things that are causing the big problems yes. in the world? And funding the current fucked up systems that, yeah. If the Mormons believe that Jesus is the, their Jesus is the Holy One of Israel, I'm like, why don't you own Israel then? And that's what they, I mean, they want to. I know, but I'm like, do it, prove it. They are, prove tr that they it's are, <laughs> they're trying. They're really, really trying. 
It's funny. I feel like all the most like nuanced, compassionate takes I have seen on social media about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian situation right now, I feel like all the most nuanced ones have come from like Jewish people that I know. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, all the Christians are making the most like unhinged commentary Why about is that so Israel. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's so weird. The Christians will like hate Jews, but then also... But appropriate yeah. because it gives them validation yeah. because they have appropriated the story to begin with. So they kind of like so strange. have to own this heritage that doesn't belong to them. Yeah. Weird, a parasitic culture. It's just yeah. bizarre. I, I was thinking... So just come up with something better. Like use your imagination. You yeah. Know? I mean, think about... Well, when you realize like how religion and mythology propagates and the way that culture develops, it really is just like storytelling and that all stories, including the ones that we tell, the fictions that we enjoy today are all derived from things that have been told before. It's just the way creativity and language and culture happens, and especially religion. And, uh, you know, the fit that people throw about the war on Christmas, and they don't, when they're trying to take, make Christian, Christmas a, a, a pagan holiday or a secular are they still holiday. On that? Do the conservatives still think there's a war on Christmas? I think they've got bigger fish to fry yeah. now at this point, but, yeah. um, but you still, you know, do hear about it, and it still is kind of this like, feeling and but it's like Christmas tree like that's all pagan stuff and uh, Saturnalia and Which the solstice. Which is basically The Purge by the way. Saturnalia every time I read about it I'm like this is the plot line of the movie The Purge. <laughs> oh was the original? Yeah. Uh, like Roman I festival? I think yes or... as far as I know. Ooh. Well anyway I'm, that, all I'm saying is like Christianity is pagan because it's a, it is just like a new iteration of paganism that in in it was stories that the Greeks told each other about something they didn't experience, about something going on in Jerusalem that used this uh, revolutionary zealot who got killed and being like, wow, this is a story, and then they grew from there. But what I'm just saying is it's just never been a pure thing. It's always just been mm -hmm. iterations of something that went before. But the power of just being like, no, it's our story. It started with us. Like, it's amazing what you can just be like, no, though. <laughs> you know, like, while I was Mormon, it's like, I grew up knowing that, like, Christmas wasn't really great, but it's, you just, that's the mindset you have to get into of, like, meh. During my healing, the Lord has manifested his divine power in peaceful and unmistakable ways. We're watching at 1.4 speed now, just so you know he is speaking, uh, like, 40% less fast than us. I wonder what he considers unmistakable ways. I hope he goes on to clarify. Mm -hmm. Because of Jesus Christ's infinite atonement. Our Heavenly Father's plan is a perfect plan. It's objectively yeah. <laughs> not. You don't even know what to do with gay people. You, the prophet, his biggest guy, you have the most direct line of communication and you don't know what to do about it. The book written for our day doesn't say anything about it. They had to change the book of Mormon like doctrinally a million times. One You're, of the few changes that you've made that you've heralded as revelations, you've had to rescind. So I I'm mean, like, uh, you need to start marketing this as messy and imperfect in a relatable, authentic way. Stop trying to market it as perfect. It's the same thing as like with the prophets. Like people, people are getting wise. You're doing yourself a disservice. This is free PR advice. An understanding of God's fabulous plan. Fabulous again! Takes the mystery out of life and the uncertainty out of our future. It allows each of us to choose how we will live here on earth and where we will live forever. You will be evicted in eternity. This cup of coffee, uh, 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 you're out of here. No family, no rights. God created it for a reason and put all that caffeine in it for it for for something, but it was not for you. I just think it's a bit rich to say that you can that to like emphasize that you can live however you want aspect of the plan when most people in Mormonism grew up Mormon and are doing the same things they've seen modeled to them. Oh yeah. Can we just point out that his God is literally like a Saw movie God? It's like, I'm gonna put you in a situation where you can't remember anything. I love you so fucking much. I love you so much, but I'm gonna watch as cancer overtakes your body and parasites eat out your toddler's eyes and while humans bomb each other and starve each other and inflict the most cruel. They always say That's that- how special you are to me. But if you if you still believe in me, even without any any rational reason or direct evidence, then I'll let you have your mansion in the then sky to live with you. me forever. And then everybody else, bang, mm. no rights, evicted, celestial kingdom, or outer darkness, depending on you know how much witchcraft you practiced in this life. It, it's truly like a psychopathic god. I really think mm -hmm. that his god is a, a genuine psychopath, which is why we invented the Kevin test, where if 
You just substitute Kevin for God, and if Kevin is doing something that you're like, Kevin, that is a psychopathic thing to do, then Same hold your God to a higher... Kevin yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> you can't let God get off simply because he's not called Kevin. Because he also could be called Kevin. If Kevin is wiping his kid's memory and then putting them in through like the most absurd amounts of torturous grief of his own make, and then if they don't act correctly the way that you foresaw them acting out... In a really myopic then, <laughs> way, given like the actual nature of the entire planet and like how small this group of people is. And then punishes them eternally. If you're like, Kevin, that's going a little too far. There are better ways to spend Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> Kevin always takes it too far, though. The baseless notion that we should eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, and it shall all be well with us is one of the most absurd lies in the universe. <laughs> Next up there with organic evolution. Everyone knows that God just created everything exactly as it is today. Monkeys, birds, trains, <laughs> it's all just been here. Also, Mormons are the kings and queens of eat, drink, and be merry. When you think about it, it's just mm -hmm. like, okay, they don't drink alcohol, they drink soda instead, and they don't... Uh, eat tiramisu, they eat like brownies, and their merriment, again, it may not involve a substance, but they're perfectly happy to fuck up the environment to buy like a third four wheeler or like, do you know what I mean? They are not to typecast, because this is, I'm, I can, uh, I don't like the language I'm using that much, um, so forgive me, but I'm like, as a group, Utah Mormons especially, they don't care about the environment, they are very much of the mindset of like, Jesus is coming back. So we can just kind of live it up. It's fine to be as wealthy as possible, even if your wealth is built on exploiting people in third world countries. Like there's not a good uh, like moral business ethic in among Utah Mormons. I think that's like quite widely known. It's a really Fraud big state for affinity. <laughs> yeah, it's like this whole yeah, thing of sense. like wealth generation, when it comes to wealth generation, the ends always justify the means and the means could be like defrauding people or exploiting people. So it's just like, Oh, okay. Some people drink alcohol, sure, but that that, that you these people still eat, drink, and be merry. Maybe mm. Russell doesn't, but like, Can I bet he eats pretty good. <laughs> eat, drink, be fabulous. <laughs> you literally have to eat, drink, and be merry to survive. <laughs> like, yeah, like your three <laughs> fundamental, especially um, the eat and drink one. They believe they can be merry, but only Mormons can experience true joy. A direct quote from Russell M. Nelson. Yeah. He literally said that only they can experience true joy. Shut up. Merriment uh, is a fraudulent kind of joy. <laughs> uh, if you're feeling merry this holiday season, you're doing something wrong. And the Holy One of Israel is giving you a side eye. I, for one, did, I think Dallin A. Chokes didn't go far enough when he was like, people sent me cards that said happy holidays. Those oh absolute idiots. Those fucking bitches daring to send me a card that didn't say Merry Christmas. Why? I couldn't believe it. I'm like, shut up. I you, couldn't believe it. You curmudgeon. Was it last year that we talked about that? Maybe. I was reminded this morning and I had to immediately text Tanner about it of how, <laughs> oh no, this was actually in 2015. Yeah, it's been a but Dallin A. Chokes said that he analyzed the Christmas cards he received and uh, then he sorted <laughs> them into three groups and in the first group he put the traditional cards celestial terrestrial Christ. celestial if you will yeah i'm like babe it's giving go to therapy because this is neuroticism coming through in your ranking of your christmas cards i just don't think it's a really good outlet maybe a sport <laughs> <laughs> this just feels like uh it's giving OCD to me as someone with OCD. People who were might not good similar. enough in their compliments and friendship toward me. I Fuck them. Like the poor third that probably just thought it was a nice card, you know, but they didn't mention Christ. Sorry, we kind of thought that Christ was your whole thing. That was generally understood between us, so yeah. we don't really need to mention it. Are there, like, people of other religions who he's allegedly building bridges with throughout the world who, like, may just send, like, a considerate he's card? <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. Um... Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say, go back to the Zizek quote about how um, you kind of need this abstractification and these conceptual realities in order to commit truly atrocious acts. Because if you are just living in the moment, witnessing life as it is, then you ca you can't do it. If you're really present with mm -hmm. an animal, you can't just hurt an animal, mm -hmm. right? It mm -hmm. just is like... Because you, you see it, you witness it, you feel it. We're empathetic. It's And I realize that not everyone has the neurochemistry to be empathetic with the vast majority of us. Yeah, there are probably people are, that can be very present. No amygdala, you yeah. know, whatever. And, like, be, In, they probably, yeah. Anyway, uh, and that's kind of how this, the Mormon thing is. So I was thinking the other day about, like, 
blessings on food and how always throughout church, we'd always say a prayer for the food as this act of like getting centered on God. But what we were really doing was just totally abstractifying. Thank you, God, for this food. Bless the hands that our dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for this meal and we pray that thou bless the hands that prepared it. What about the actual fucking animal that lived its whole life in God knows what kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Or the exploited worker who probably produced that food. (laughs) Like there are like two levels of people that went through more than whoever like rustled this up in a pan. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. But and so, that's the one that gets thanked. And that's what I, because so now if I, wrote. even when I eat an animal, I sit there and I'm like, thank you to whatever chicken lived. It's, and I have, and, and I just feel that I try to like have a moment where I feel through that experience and realize the actual cost that went into me sustaining my body and connecting with that reality rather than just this abstract thing that Mm -hmm. poofed this uh, meal into onto my plate. You don't buy chicken though, do you? Occasionally I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. I've never seen you do that. I I really try to keep it to a minimum, but I've just had such like disordered eating where I'll literally be like, go like two days without eating because like any like type of tofu or fake meat, I'm just Yeah, you do what you can. Tana brought impossible bowls over to my house today. So he deserves your vegan brownie <laughs> points, guys, okay? But, you know, even, nice. like, I, I'm still, I don't ever want to, like, push that reality away. Exactly, like, I yeah. want to feel it, and yeah. I want to know that, and that goes into mm-hmm. choices I make. And if, you know, I'm, yeah. a, I'm, I'm a critter at the end of the day, just a creature. Yep. <laughs> but trying to have compassion and really engage with reality as such, rather than just being like, oh, my mansion in the heaven, you know, something else other than this. <laughs> I saw this, um... Mormon saying on TikTok last night that, um, you know, like worldly people who suck are just about living in the present moment. And I'm like, first of all, name one person who's living in the present moment. I couldn't <laughs> name anyone. Um, and, you know, the, the good people think celestial. It was basically this kind of vibe. Uh, and I just thought that was like so interesting as people who kind of view being in the present moment as kind of like the highest spiritual pursuit really Mm -hmm. they're essentially just like lost in a story which is taking them away from the present moment which does make you less aware of suffering or like Mm -hmm. actually like the things that are good it just makes you less aware Mm -hmm. if you're constantly lost in your story of superiority which like to call a spade spade a spade is what this all is here's the great news of god's plan the very things that will make your mortal life the best it can be are exactly the same things that will make your life throughout all eternity the best it can be. Like what? (laughs) (laughs) Paying tithing, going to church every Sunday, reading your scriptures, everyone knows how thrilling all that is. Just thinking about living in the present and how you can, you know, we're always living in abstraction and in the world of thought and form and it is tough to like, again, recede to that just state of awareness, that that innermost degree of consciousness where we're just witnessing. But now, in 20 years, in 100 years, in 1,000 years, in 100 million years, so you're sitting there in the celestial kingdom in 100 million years from now, you will never, your experience of consciousness will never not recede to that. It will never exist outside of the, con- the present moment, right? You'll always, there will always be that side of you that's just witnessing. So learning how to be in that state, how to be comfortable there, how to enjoy the refuge of that perspective seems like it would be of utmost importance for, you know, now and in eternity, right? Because it will never not be that. Amen, Tom. I'm thinking to let's kill you right now, making a a black tea. Do you want um, I think I am thoroughly caffeinated. Thank you. Today, to assist you to qualify for the rich blessings Heavenly Father has for you, I invite you to adopt the practice of thinking celestial. A Mormon mom with that thousand yard far off look, just like, is that when she's yeah. thinking <laughs> celestial? And I think celestial is just like the psychedelic se- celestial seasonings guy. <laughs> 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 Trying to pull me into a vortex. The bear. The, <laughs> the bear. sleepy time yeah. bear. You, go, you know that guy fucks. I don't trust him, but do, I would die for him. Do you think uh, he and Paddington will ever do a collab? They really should, right? They probably have historic beef. You reckon? And we I thought they were like solution. lovers or best friends. <laughs> okay, or, yeah, maybe they are lovers. They're just like, seem so cozy core and comfort core. But I think 
they are so they're there's so much electricity between them that they come together so powerfully like magnets that they then have to have time apart. Sure. They're, they're they need intermittent their own lovers. Worlds. Yeah. Because it's like two stars burning too brightly next to each other. Yeah. It can become quite intense. Definitely. Special means being spiritually minded. It's all just bullshit <laughs> because it's like being spiritually minded. Like all your Be lost in thought form. It's just such a boring version of spirituality because it's just like you just keep thinking about the same stuff that we've been telling you for decades. <laughs> Don't listen to anyone keep else. Doing the same <laughs> stuff. It's like that's not spiritual. Like that's such a weak form of spirituality. Like it's not expansive. You're not like actually giving us anything. Yes, for us it'll give us nothing, I guess. <laughs> Heard from the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob that to be spiritually minded is life eternal. Humanity is accessed in the present moment. <laughs> Mortality is a master class in learning to choose the things of greatest eternal import. Far too many people live as though this life is all there is. I didn't make the joke, but I was going to say, and this is a great time to bring up my master class that I'm giving on doing open heart surgery on yourself. <laughs> <So yeah. laughs> okay, uh, it's easy to, I'm thinking about Heaven's Gate again because he reminds me a lot so of that Heaven's guy. So Heaven's Gate coded, yeah. Um, and, you know, people are like, how foolish would you have to be to really believe that aliens were coming on the Haley Bob Comet and that people needed to kill themselves to be ascend up into the spacecraft to be taken away before Earth is destroyed. Mm. And it's like, actually, you don't have to be that crazy. God because lives on a star called Kolob. Literally, God lives on a planet named Kolob. You can they get came here. if you're righteous enough. They, it's they not that seeded the Earth. These You guys constantly <laughs> ask yourself if the prophet asked you to kill yourself or someone else, would you do it? So it's clearly close enough that you're thinking about it. You're doing the thought exercises. I learned about Jones town because an institute instructor told me was like you remember Joe's town you know he made him drink the Kool-Aid and die and you know at the time I really wrestled with that and then I got to thinking if the prophet asked me to drink the Kool-Aid I would I would mm. and I think we all need to be like that and it's like oh was, was that the takeaway with it because <laughs> Because he's like, yeah, I would. Is that okay? That I, would? <laughs> I think it's fine. It he's does like, seem weird. U.S. teenagers do. should do that too, for sure. <laughs> he's like, I thought it was fine to just kill yourself if a prophet asks you to. Because their whole thing is not um, on like they don't believe in objective morality or anything. It's it's all relative to the organization. Like whatever the org whatever this culture is okay here, whatever they say goes. It's okay if they do objectively bad things because that's not what makes something bad or good. Not this like yeah. objective measurement. It's always well. It's the person doing it. If it was a prophet, then it was done for a good reason. However, your choices today will determine three things: where you will live throughout all eternity, the kind of body with which you will be. Rest Sorry, what? I think that's I, just like bad teleprompter reading. <laughs> he was saying we'll determine three things where you will live, but he said it like, we'll determine three things where you will live for eternity, like the international <laughs> spell. It doesn't matter. I don't care. He's I 99 <laughs> again. He can do whatever he wants. There is no judgment. He's remarkable. Again, this is all just classism reinvented. Mm. It's like, hey, there are three tiers in heaven and... <laughs> Class, uh, the top class. The fact that it they depends on where you live. The rich neighborhood, the gated neighborhood, the pearly gates. You want to live in the gated community. These are the same people <laughs> that will be like, think not of the things of the world. Eat, drink, and be merry is stupid because it's not just about like hedonism. But then it's like again. You think that the happiest, best people deserve to have the best houses, and like you can't even conceptualize a reality where your worthiness isn't correlated with how rich you are. Like, what if it's like the people, you would imagine people that are so celest celestial, they wouldn't need a giant mansion. Mm -hmm. Why would you need that? <laughs> you would be content with Your body the doesn't even, Why would you need even need the experience of, yeah, yeah, it's like if you can't experience discomfort or pain. You won't need or shelter or privacy or anything. So yeah. <laughs> even the concept of having a home in heaven doesn't really make sense. No, nothing makes sense. Nothing about human civilization or identity or relationships makes any sense outside of this context here mm -hmm. and now. You will live throughout all eternity. The kind of body with which you will be resurrected. Hey, TK Smoothie, yeah, remember. So if you're not righteous, you will lose your genitals in the hereafter. Boning is only celestial. So when you are having sex, that is thinking celestially because you're not going to be able to enjoy that outside of the celestial kingdom. I'm really glad he mentioned that because if there's one thing we learned this year, it's that there are three types of eunuchs. There are. And sometimes so God makes know. eunuchs for the, for the kingdom of heaven. Yep. And so. so all us little eunuchs will be playing our little yep. trumpets, being little servants. Did you see that? Like, uh, it was one of the early 
apostles quotes about how unmarried women will have a place in the celestial kingdom. They'll be servants to a man that wants them. Awesome. <laughs> like, That's yeah. so sick. Man, the LDS church. When you dig back, it's like you see pictures of them and you're like, mm. <laughs> kind of off-putting people. You know, it's all these neck beards and they're like... What surprised me is just how many of them were marrying their children, their, their foster children that they, they abducted from a Native American tribe. Pretty spooky. Mm -hmm. You look at like any of the fundamentalist branches and you're like, oh, that's what Mormon, like mainstream Mormonism looked like 150 years ago. It was just a Mormon Stories interview I watched with this girl who escaped the, oh, the Kingston clan. Do you know about them? Yeah. I didn't, they're, Not a ton. They're like an them. incestuous fundamentalist group. Oh, most of them are because really that's, incestuous. it all started with this, like Brigham Young's secretary who invented the, uh, the Deseret alphabet literally like was in an incestuous relationship with a child. Like Ooh. it's insane. And that was all just like open, like, yes, the, we have won. We've conquered the West. And now the most manipulative male manipulator, violent male manipulator types get to have a heyday in the hot sun, uh, yep. live out their fantasy. And those with whom you will live forever. Just again, calling this a spade. This is literally manipulation. Mm. Literally. Like if Kevin was like, Hey, listen, how much you pay me is going to depend on where you're able to live who you're going to be able to have around you, who, what family members you're going to be able to be around, and what kind of fucking body you have. Snip, snip, if you're not paying up to me. So, Kevin, God. Think celestial. In my first message as president of the church, I encourage you to begin with the end in mind. Always a great strategy. <laughs> Very That's ideal a, for a cult, though. It's sort of the opposite of the Alan Watts insight that, like, music is not enjoyed with the end in mind. You're not just like, oh, I can't wait for this song to get to the last note. Then it'll be really good. But that's how it's it should like, be if you were thinking of celestial. <laughs> music is for the enjoyment of music, for the entire moment-to-moment -moment experience. But music is merriment, which is fake happiness. <laughs> it's not clicking for you yet, Tanner, I can tell. This means making the celestial kingdom your eternal goal, and then carefully considering where each of your decisions while here on Earth will place you in the next world. It's also so stupid to call it a goal because it's like, you just basically get handed this goal because it's like, okay, you'll either suffer or you won't suffer. Do you know what I mean? No mm. one's going to be like, yeah, I want the one where I have to suffer. So like, obviously everyone's going to go for it, but it's just this one type of existence you're just supposed to naturally want to live. And it's like, it just sounds boring and you have no reason to really want to go there except for fear of the worst ones. It's all just fear. This is like the skeeziest timeshare pitch <laughs> Yeah. where it's like, we're going to sell you a real estate in the sky and you're, where you're going to be able to attend in the resort is going to be determined by, again, how much you're paying and how much you're devoting. Like, this whole thing crumbles with like one or two questions of like, oh, what will we be doing there? And then it's like, oh, we're well, praising God and doing Living, his work and laughing, creating. and loving. <laughs> and it's like, won't, like... Are we going to be skateboarding? Are we going to be building other... You know, what's going into it? And they can't really tell you because he's never actually seen it because he's just making this up and going along with what he was told in lieu of any kind of <clears throat> real insight into the nature of reality. But, like, what his objective is is to drive people into being more, like, more controlled, offering more of their time, energies, and interest into the church. How many people, like, aren't... Uh, cultivating their art, aren't pursuing their interests, aren't That's what's making me earnestly sad. learning about the world and experiencing yeah. the joy of learning about the world without fear. Like Mormon women pretty much universally allow huge chunks of their interests and like parts of their personalities to just be gone forever once they get married. Like we have seen that time and time again. We hear it from ex-Mormons time and time again. And that's just like one, but like Mormon people already are, are giving up, you know, especially because also if you have eight kids and a calling, you don't have time for your art. Mm. So they're already giving up so much. And then his message is like, do that even more, have even less going on outside of the group. And it's like, it's always a very generic message. So different people will take different things from it, but that's sure. what's so dangerous because there is, a massive percentage of Mormonism that is extremely scrupulous. I would say like reaching clinical levels of scrupulosity. And they will exploit that to the end. Yeah, basically. and this is just a <laughs> fucking new vehicle for their OCD. The Lord has clearly taught that only men and women who are sealed as husband and wife in the temple 
Only those who have pantomimed their ritualistic murder by having their throat slit, their bowels cut out, and their heart removed will be able to enjoy celestial lovemaking for all time in our beautiful time, eternal timeshare. Welcome to your mansion in heaven in a pearly gated community. Do you know what's crazy is that they don't believe that teaching as hard as they used to, like that if you're not married in the temple you won't go to the celestial because now Wasn't this recent this was this year no He's i know that. but now the average church member thinks oh well if someone just doesn't find anyone that wants to marry them in this life god will give them a chance in the next life but i yeah. feel like in the past in the early polygamous days it was like no you fucking find someone like find anyone <laughs> if all the the really obvious holes in this plan you know make it fall apart thankfully the god of the gaps will just the make god it the all gaps. right <laughs> the god of the gaps top of the pops <laughs> Fruit of the loom. <laughs> All covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise have an end when men are dead. Close quote. <laughs> so true. I'm just closing the quote there. That was, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm okay. just quote that quote right there. <laughs> So true, though, impermanence. <laughs> wow. Thus, if we unwisely choose to live celestial laws now, we are choosing to be resurrected with a celestial What does that mean? Somebody choosing to date a non-member and then just get married outside the covenant. Oh, a, t a celestial law where anything, everything's just willy-nilly. You can just eat anything that God has made and drink anything that God has made and date, love anyone the way God has made you. I just, I don't buy this at all. The way he's describing all these oaths and promises and business negotiations, I'm like, God sounds like all the most boring and awful parts of humanity combined into I know, one. It's like I know. all the violent lordship, me. <laughs> Oh my, I'm just a humble peasant in the, in, the, in the presence of my lord. Like, I hate that shit. I hate <laughs> yeah. business. I hate negotiation. All that shit. Like, oaths and bonds. Like, these and, are like, all you my least favorite me. things. I and know. he was like, you need to get stuck in our investment, eternal investment portfolio. I'm like, I am fucking yeah. out of here. If I were to put a gun out there, I'd be like... This fun, a fun like grandpa god who like teaches you things god. in the garden. We're choosing not to live with our families forever. I, it's, I'm not, this is just how it is, folks. You're gonna lose your family. I, that's- God said it, so it's actually not manipulative. <laughs> They're gonna be burned it's alive at the last day. every cult tells you, it's different when we say it. So, my dear brothers and sisters, how and where and with whom do you want to live? For uh, not with people like you, okay. frankly. Spending eternity with this guy, it sounds so Dumb. Sounds so boring. Yeah, uh. because we won't need surgeons, so it's like even his main thing won't be really right. I guess his main thing's probably being a prophet now. Do you think he... Now it's being president yeah. of the corporation, so like, of the That is kind of low-key, like what comes after heart surgeon? We generally think of heart surgeon as pretty top tier. Now he's just going to be uh, out there with the lowly content creators who are being missionaries in the hereafter. Yeah. When you make choices, I invite you to take the long view, an eternal view. Put Jesus Christ first, because your eternal life is dependent upon your faith in him and in his atonement. It is also dependent upon your obedience to Just, his laws. Like, listen, listen, if you're an, an active Latter-day Saint person, listen here, just like an objective person, pretend that this guy is the president of the Jehovah Witnesses, and notice how often he's using fear mm -hmm. to invoke a response to motivate you, to being like, if you don't do this, that couch bad love. stuff will happen. Like, if the love of Christ is not naturally enlivening and, enlivening and enriching and in cultivating my life, mm -hmm. then it's not there. And if you have yeah. to use fear as a mechanism to manipulate people, it's certainly not there. You're so right. The fact that, I mean, it's always fear. We've known this, right? That's why we do this whole fucking channel, like the whole operation. High control groups always are running on sh shame and fear. But it is wild because now, all these years later, just reflecting on the types of like spiritual concepts that speak to you and like what it would take for you to like get into something. It's, it's just... Yeah, there's like nothing beautiful at all. Mm -hmm. At all, at all. Even like, okay, even if you want to have a relationship with Christ and make that the priority, is is Christ using fear to manipulate you? Is right. is that what Christ is giving you? Like, hey like man, God if you're not love. obedient, I'm going to fucking kill you. You're going to burn in hell forever. Oh, great. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Josh. You're so loved by you. Great. Thanks for making me this way. Oh, 
like fear is never a good motivator. Even with things like, okay, going on walks every day, I think is a really good spiritual practice. And yeah, it can be true that like, sometimes it's hard to get yourself out there, but like when you do, you know you feel better. So there's a bit of like, you have to force yourself. But in general, you know how amazing going on walks is. So you shouldn't have to use fear. And mm. I actually think fear is like the thing Fear and shame is what's creating the resistance that sometimes makes it hard to go on the walk mm. is because we're having that voice of like, you should. So then any amount within you that's like, oh, I'm kind of tired today. Then it becomes like this internal battle when it's like, just go or don't go. Mm. Like, it really doesn't matter. Kind of like the way that meditation, you know, when I first got into mm. it, there was a guilt about it that, that I had a residual feeling from praying that if I'm not praying mm. every day, then I'm going to be punished. And if I'm not meditating every day, bad things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And now it's like when I meditate, I do it as like, an act of rest like it's just mm -hmm. like a an exhale after a long inhale it just makes sense i can just sit and let my body enjoy the experience of just centering and being still and breathing it's not because i'm like oh if i don't do this i'm not going to be able to see my family forever mm -hmm. obedience paves the way for a joyful life for you today and a grand eternal reward so just can we just keep the score here? Only Mormons can experience mm. true joy, mm -hmm. but life isn't for be making merry. Uh, but if you are obedient, it's the best and only way to have true happiness. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, and you may do everything right and still have a terrible time, mm -hmm. but don't lose faith because that mansion is coming. I guarantee it. Would I, a 99-year-old man, lie to you? Nice thing is he doesn't know he's lying, so he doesn't have to. All these original cult leaders are selling an actual physical vision of, like, this promised land. Like, with Joseph Smith, it was very much like, we're going to build, like, this amazing dream city and everything will be perfect. And then, like, over the years, it has to get watered down because it gets bigger. And it's like, you're, we're away from the original cult leaders' promises now. It's just, like, this organization. The business so now, class has definitely they, taken over the church. There's And they have to just keep telling people that this is the thing that will make you happy, but so the people are having to convince themselves like this is the peak happiness I'm capable of experiencing as a human being and everyone else's joy is worth less when it's like, I do think a lot of the time LDS people suffer a lot from these kinds of teachings and from being fully burnt out and having like no time for self, you know, just, they're just so duty driven their entire lives. If you have eight kids and church callings that like you just, that's constantly what you're doing. That is a hard life. But then they are also often quite well off which helps but I don't know I guess what I'm saying is it's just like obviously ridiculous to say that Mormon people are the happiest people or even the more ridiculous statement which he has made which is that they're the only yeah. happy people the only people experiencing joy and it's already so conceited and myopic to believe that you are, are experiencing the Holy Ghost and you have this experience that nobody else in the world has because you're so fucking righteous mm -hmm. and everyone else is so wicked that you're just you get to have this thing and but like, look at anybody else's conversion experience to any other high control group and everybody talks about the same exact thing because it's the same exact mm -hmm. psychological phenomenon playing out. Already so self-righteous to be like, I am having this, the real experience. Meanwhile, all of you poor heathens. And it's wild that it works because the average person he's talking to has been in this thing their whole life. And so they know at least on some level that they're not like experiencing the highest joy you could imagine a human experiencing, which then takes it to the shame or like they always have to believe there's something that will change soon, which is just the classic thing with cults, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, not yet, Didn't, not yet, not yet. There's like that famous quote from Brene Brown talking about sh organizations that use shame and how it's always, go always goes hand in hand with manipulation and dishonesty. And mm -hmm. it's like, look at the LDS church. There's a reason you can't name five of Joseph Smith's underage wives, or they don't put all of his polygamous affairs in the Joseph Smith movie. Why they're not actually talking about the real events that were playing out in his life or that led up to his death because they're just, they're trying to squash that mm -hmm. because they cannot be real. They can't be true. All they can do is use shame and manipulation to keep people, to sell status. They're, what they're doing is really yeah. selling yeah. spiritual status. Think uh, like you're a, okay. a, a top tier person right now. You're business class already, baby. And it really can't be overstated how much like religions like this are selling people a status game. And especially if you were born into this. And so you're already by virtue of who your family was and just like having been raised in the system and like learned the rules. Well, you have status in this, in this status game. 
Like you're losing that if you leave. And like, we cannot handle loss of status as humans. Which is why leaving the church is such a hard, difficult experience Mm -hmm. that so many people have to like talk about and go through therapy for. Most healthy organizations you can leave without needing, having a whole existential crisis, right? They say that cults are uh, organizations you can't leave with your dignity intact. It's Mm -hmm. definitely the church. Um, one of, I was going to say, one of my favorite criticisms that we get about is like, you guys are just the people in the great and spacious building judging the Mormons. It's like, okay, first of all, you like name another religion who has spent more money on great and spacious buildings outside the Catholic Church. We're in $20 Ikea <laughs> stools. He's in a velvet armchair. <laughs> in a notoriously great and spacious building. Literally, yeah. <laughs> and we're just sitting here like, again, like I think of my life as like, this, you know, sitting around this tree of life, which is this kind of garden mentality of cultivation and enrichment and community based on mutual admiration and uh, delight in the particulars of another person. And I don't sit around being like, oh, my friends are doing this and this and Mm -hmm. that, and therefore they're not going to be with me in all eternity. I'm just like, I just love you as a person. And I just want to like water you like I'm there at the base of this tree of life watering because the tree of life feeds me too. Mm -hmm. And then there's these people in this great fish building who are like, that's not true joy. You'll never know what it's like. True joy. True joy is in this building with our fluorescent lights and our profit, <laughs> you know? It's honestly like the more insecure people are, the more uh, like enmeshed they are with others in that like what other people choose to do with their life is like bothering them. And I feel like that plays out at every level, like you just said, uh, you don't sit around being like, oh, my friends are doing this and this. You know, you're not like constantly... Uh, like checking on your friends to make sure they're not like doing anything wrong because you just have that like love and trust but when you're a less healthy person everything's just about like how it what everything says about you so you doing anything different from me it makes me feel insecure or like Mm -hmm. triggers that in me and we see that like in religion but then outside of it as well in like friendships for example it's funny you can see the projection of when people who have only lived in a certain, you know, constricted mentality, how that's, how easily that gets projected onto other people. And you see that in the way that they have to frame everything as temptation mm. and assume that people outside are A, trying to tempt them, that they have fallen into temptation versus just living ordinary and fulfilling mm-hmm. lives. Many people, uh, I know there's plenty of people who aren't happy or content or, you know, whatever. The world's a fucked up place. But like, there are people who are doing it and usually they're not the ones interested in Mormonism because their life is fine and they teach you that as a Mormon, as a Mormon missionary to find the people who are going through hard times Mm -hmm. because that can be manipulated to serve the church's purposes. I'm never like tempted to go to church. I'm not like, oh, I'm tempted to do this thing that I think is wrong. Mm -hmm. I just think like supporting this organization is wrong for me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's not like, you know, it's not that. Like temptation doesn't really have to be that big a part of life. Like sometimes I might like want to eat something that that, like I know long term isn't going to make me feel good that day so sure. I, so I guess there's like a temptation there but then there's a bigger part of me that wants to feel good later so I guess there's like that but that's not really like a big phenomenon that you're like wrestling with every day yeah. it's just like sometimes you want to eat candy and you do and sometimes you don't temptation is like obviously central to and, all of this and most people aren't like full on hedonists mm-hmm. I don't even think the, the actual no, hedonists feel... were like the modern idea uh-huh. of hedonists yeah. no it's not like everybody is if you're outside of the church you're just like living strung out 24 right. 7 like it's, trashing your body yeah. it's like a lot of people can just have like integrated balanced relationships with substances with not going to church with their grounding exercises with you yeah. know whatever it is and without all say, the shame and manipulation i think it's easier to be a lot healthier outside of systems like this because you actually can prioritize like all the different aspects of being a healthy well-rounded person instead of being so laser focused on this one that like other aspects fall by the wayside when you are confronted with a dilemma think celestial when tested by temptation think the celestial When life or loved ones let you down, think celestial. This is literally for a child. What the hell? This is the this is the main guy. Best his best stuff. This is the definition of a platitude, of like a short, concise phrase that seems deep. Yeah, that is just that serves the purpose of just like diluting meaning. Mm -hmm, That was nice. I feel good. Way of saying. Do whatever the church tells you to do all the time. Listen yeah. to me. All the, it's just the palatable version of that because 
the, obviously everyone's idea of what Celestial is is painted by you. Not really by you, but kind of by you. Do you think they had the Think Celestial merch? Definitely. Ready, like locked and loaded. Now I get why like someone Ponderize. on Reddit said, yeah, this is the Ponderize of, our, of the year. Ooh. You, uh, he's a he's a creator. He knows what it's like when you just know what you're dropping is fire. <laughs> like, let's get the merch going. I mean, they're gonna blow, they're audience, gonna eat this shit up. Yeah, like he's not wrong. This is a great Mormon talk. Like this is what the Mormons want. Turn it off. Think celestial. Yeah. When someone dies prematurely, think celestial. Don't grieve. Don't analyze. What are the actual mechanics of this plan? Just. Think celestial. Obviously, anyone who believes in Mormonism, if they lose a loved one prematurely, they're gonna think that they're in heaven. Like, that's already established. Again, you are talking to your church, people who are already on board with you. I love how he did air quotes, like premature. Like There's no premature because God... Which is insane to, again, act as if God is in control of everything, including when people die, and then having the balls to say that uh, what you intake will affect how long you live. He literally was like, what's my secret to living long? Well, I... <laughs> You know, it's like, that's a Mormon pitch point. Oh, we live so long, we have healthy lives. What, God is in control, right? Like, right, right, right? Like, if he's controlling every aspect of including when people die, including people killing each other, then it's, yeah, then you it's can't, then there is no free will. If there's, it's either all free will or no free will. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, <laughs> except for the times when God intervenes to, you know, send a, an angel with a flaming sword, for instance, for a really important emergency where you really need an unmistakable witness. What did he send that for? Was it to stop the genocide? Or was it to, to help the starving it was children? was for the child marriage. Oh, it was for the child. Yeah, that's right. Child marriage. One lingers with a devastating illness. Think celestial. When the pressures of life crowd in upon you, Think celestial as you recover from an accident. Again, everyone listening to this is already Mormon. You think they're not thinking about the afterlife or God or Jesus or the gospel when they are losing their loved ones? <laughs> of course they are. They're praying more than ever. He's like, new trick just dropped. You guys have not, dropped. you have not understood this. This is going to change your life. You mean to tell me this man is in direct communion with the creator of the universe? The guy, the person that made tardigrades and all the rings around Saturn was like, tell them, think celestial. Uh, and he's like, Jesus, my Lord, you've done it again. <laughs> as you recover from an accident or injury as I am doing now, think celestial. As you focus on new transcendental meditation mantra just dropped. <laughs> this is, it's literally just like, dissociate. <laughs> yeah, honestly. I'm not here. I'm in my mansion. Literally sky. pretend that you're not even alive right now on Earth. <laughs> literally just pretend you're dead. That's also what he's <laughs> literally saying. Like that. Sometimes the best you can be in this just life is dead. Just think about being dead. <laughs> then it won't be so bad. And I simply remember how be about being so dead and then I don't feel. Expect to encounter opposition. Give us some examples of what, what this might look like in application. McKinsley, I've noticed you've been thinking celestial, and I'm here to oppose you. I'm tired of all your celestial thinking. Decades ago, a professional colleague criticized me for having too much temple in me. Oh, and he's coming back with a vengeance in his profit tool. Ah. Someone fucking wronged me decades ago and said that I have too much temple in me. Too I'm gonna drag them as the prophet of this fucking church. Wow. Never let a grudge go, Galvas. I what love What does that it. mean? He's got too many like violent death oaths in there? <laughs> too many ritual anointings? Too I'm many uh, sprung upon you oaths? <laughs> and more than one supervisor penalized me because of my faith. Penalized? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I would love to hear the details of being penalized for your faith, because in our As a world, heart surgeon. that phrase is always used right in someone's uh, trial for murder or fraud. <laughs> if you were working in like a heart surgery setting, it's probably that like you you know you can't be bringing up your church when yeah. you're talking to someone about their particular. You know what I mean? You're like operating on your heart, but like just so you know. How much you pay to my church will depend where you're going in this afterlife. And they're like, please, can you not be doing this right now? Maybe he did just have an asshole supervisor once who just persecuted him simply for the fact that he was Mormon. But knowing Mormons, no I would put money on the fact that it was probably that he was inappropriately bringing his religion into the workplace. No, Mormons to everybody else is like, we are, you persecute us. Anytime you contradict with us, us, anytime you disagree with us, that is persecution. We'll send people to your house. People who, by the way, have paid to go on two year, full-time, door-to-door marketing sales missions for us. 
who we've coerced into doing that by guilting them, will do that, but you doing and saying anything about us is going above and beyond to destroy us. At Thinking Celestial enhanced my career. As you think celestial, your heart will change. Can you some examples? Wait, that's kind of where my, he's saying like, yeah, he was penalized, but ultimately like he was, a, his career took off because he stayed close to God. But it's making me think of in the Twin Flames documentary where they would, the leaders would be like, yeah, just get, if you, ha if you have to take actions that get you a restraining order, just do it. Like think, think Twin Flame, think uh, eternally. I feel like they use the same kind of logic. Do you know what I mean? No, totally. So it's like, even if you're getting in trouble at work for being inappropriate about your religion, just keep at it because God will help you have success. Yeah. There, there is a line like in having confidence that can you can change the circumstance your circumstances but then there you cross a line where mm -hmm. where all confidence artists do mm -hmm. where then they assume that whatever they are confident about mm -hmm. will become reality because they've used that sort of mechanism to affect certain kinds of changes and then they're not able to distinguish between what is true and untrue because they're so certain of their own ability to make truth happen mm -hmm. really well it's said. very scary You'll want to pray more often. So I guess what I'm saying is like, it's kind of him, him being like, oh, the reason I'm successful is because I was true to God. He was confident in something and had success. But plenty of people do well in their careers and have no affiliation with God or specifically the Mormon God, mm -hmm. Elohim, J uh, a.k.a. Adam, mm -hmm. Adam God theory. Even anymore? though there's no correlation whatsoever, there also is. It's like they like logically know, like, yeah, you can also be successful without being Mormon, but it's something different and you don't enjoy it. It's or like, something. I mean, sometimes it all people... just ultimately comes back to having to be like, well, those people are miserable. Yeah. That's the fault. That's the delusional story at the end of it. All. Oh, and people will say to us in our comments all the time, they'll be like, you know, someday everybody gets to a point where they're so broken and beaten down by this life that they have to turn to that God. They join the Mormon church at 17. And I'm like, are you living in a shoebox? Like, uh, not to be classist, but just speaking to like what you're working with. Like, have you never met anybody in this world? Did Christopher Hitchens on his deathbed be like, wow, I was too broken down by the world. And now I finally admit God is like Ricky Gervais. Is he dealing with that? Like, no, there are, you just look around and see that there are plenty of people who aren't driven to that same conclusion just because you were beaten down by life. And that was your coping mechanism. Doesn't mean that that's like an inevitable reality for everyone. And if you just thought about it for like two seconds, Seconds. Just crunch some numbers. Sorry, I have to eat this protein. <laughs> crunch some protein bars. <laughs> Can I have one bite? Oh, that's a more than one bite. The Lord's perspective transcends your mortal wisdom. His response to your prayers may surprise you and will help you to think celestial. Consider the Lord's response to the prophet Joseph Smith when he pleaded for relief in Liberty Jail. The Lord taught the prophet. Sorry. <laughs> Think celestial, babe. It's like, why did I commit bank fraud? And <laughs> this jail sucks. The Lord taught the prophet that his inhumane treatment would give him experience and be for his good. If thou endure it well, the Lord promised, God shall exalt thee on high. If Mormons knew more about how the world works and had more exposure to other groups and other people. How many cult leaders go to prison? So oh no, many. I was just thinking about, and not even cult leaders, I was thinking about like Malcolm X, who in prison turned to Islam and had a very, like a spiritual rebirth experience there where he was like fully converted and then his life had meaning and purpose and he never doubted and never, with you know. That was his full thing. And you're going to tell me that Malcolm X was any less devoted to his religion than fucking Joseph Smith? Mm. I think not. The Lord was teaching Joseph to think celestial and to envision an eternal reward rather than focus on the excruciating difficulties of the day. Our prayers can be and should be living discussion. We've already said this a million times, but he's literally just being like dissociate, dissociate, yeah. <laughs> dissociate. When you can make of your own body an inner sanctuary, I really do believe that the secret to dealing with pain, the trick for dealing with pain, isn't to just detach mm -hmm. and, oh, my telestial fallen Go corrupt to an body. abstract reality. You're literally, literally saying escape reality. Yeah, it's like go into it, be present, sit with it, be inquisitive about it. And it is sort of counterintuitive because we want to evade and avoid pain at all costs. Mm -hmm. It's like our number one thing. But uh, 
This is like so stage two of James Fowler stages. Of stage <laughs> <three. I'm laughs> right, like, right. Not even funny. Well, he's he's the he's representing the Good Shepherd, man. I was thinking about the Good Shepherd the other day. I was like, what a fitting uh, metaphor that the good shepherd is going to take care of you. What are shepherds for? You think shepherds are on the sheep's team? You think the sheep and the shepherd are friends? No. The only reason Mm -hmm. you think sheep were born to be herded in these, uh, herded by these humans and then kept in these gated communities? No, they're there literally to be sheared for wool, to be exploited, and then to be fucking killed and eaten. And so it's like, yeah, uh, the idea of like all of us has this, these just mm-hmm. part of the herds for Jesus, and we're just part of this. Mm-hmm. He's the good shepherd that'll lead us there. And the bishop, which a bishop is, uh, uh, I think, the Latin derivative of a, a pastor. A pastor is the Latin, but it's equal to the Latin, which is shepherd. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, they're literally fleecing mm-hmm. you. That's <laughs> why it's called that. Wow, you, that was clever. And this is a perfect example. Pulling the wool right over your eyes. <laughs> As you think celestial. You will find yourself avoiding anything that robs you of your agency. I agree with that. There's like something good in there, you know. <laughs> like the more, the more you kind of have a higher perspective on all things, the more that you don't tolerate bullshit and you don't allow people or things to come into your life that kind of disrupt the peaceful climate you've created. Yes. There is, most things are totally beyond our perception of control <clears throat> and the few things that are under our perception of control See how perfect a talk like this is for just anybody extracting whatever meaning from it they need. Like everyone has a different idea of what thinks celestial means. Like to some people that could just help them be like, oh yeah, the little things don't matter as much. But then to other people, it's going to be like, oh, should I read my scriptures for another hour today? Or should I go outside and ride my bike and get some sunshine? Well, it's the scriptures that's going to help. Do you know what I mean? It can so easily lend itself to just... Again, becoming more scrupulous. And these people definitely exist, dare I say, at a higher rate in this group. A friend who left the church around the same time we did posted, like, after I left, I had ex- I experienced depression every single day in the church and have not since leaving. This was however many years ago that's been. I have experienced depression before and after, so... Yeah, I, I can I have definitely depression. Feel like <laughs> <laughs> I'm just skilled like that. About me. <laughs> um, but I've definitely learned how to, like, manage it way better yeah. and to ride with it and integrate it better. It's not a crisis. Exactly. And I was way more anxious in the church. Mm-hmm. And I can see the ways that the church uh, created that con- that inner turmoil and conflict as a... Through mm. guilt, shame, and manipulation that constantly had me feeling bad about everything, like I was under attack from the outside world, that I was constantly summing up, succumbing to temptation, that I wasn't good enough, that I was this fallen mm. depraved thing, when in fact I was just like living a pretty average I know. life for a human It all felt so high stakes, and it's like, you're just like a regular person doing pretty regular things for the most part. Like, yeah, there's the church in there, but... And when you let go of that, and you're just like, I'm just going to exist, and not be like constantly being the cop in my own cop god cop in my mm-hmm. own head and patrolling every and policing everybody else in this world mm-hmm. and i'm just gonna like talk about my perspective as i see it and share my opinions as they're relevant or mm-hmm. or irrelevant and you know just live my life without that constant like oh, what's from satan and what am i oh, am i gonna think of celestial oh, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> it's amazing for me to look back on even times where i wouldn't have described myself as overly anxious while mormon i just think like the baseline level of anxiety that i was used to was so different so again just like the whole mindset you're encouraged to have of constantly checking yourself for sin or empathy or whatever that's only one aspect of it though like i just didn't know peace because mm-hmm. it wasn't really uh i guess there were times that uh like church experiences would produce a feeling of peace in me but i don't know i just had no like baseline of peace like i do now mm-hmm. because i feel like i've actually done like useful spiritual work post-mormonism it where gave- peace is a priority now i've just said this before to borrow elder maxwell's metaphor that the church is like, gives support like a scaffolding. He called it the scaffolding of the soul, that it helps you build up your internal temple. I don't think he used the term internal Except temple. Except it's like the scaffolding in New York that they never take down. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, there forever. That's how the church wants to be. It's like, no, we're going to keep you here. When in fact, I really believe that a church should be like a school where you graduate and be like, mm-hmm. thank you for your help. Any addiction, be it gaming, gambling, debt, drugs, alcohol. Church? Sorry. Can church be an addiction? Gaming, gambling, debt. Maybe you should have... I just don't think you should say debt. I think you should reframe that because I feel like what he's maybe trying to say is like... Spending. Overspending. Yeah, like shopping, I guess, or whatever. But I'm like, 
it's not really very nice to like just lump debt in as an addiction when like so many people are in debt through no fault of their own. Yeah, a lot of people, they, they've encouraged people, them. they've said that uh, education is one of the things worth going in debt for. Yeah. I don't know that he specifically has said that, but that when, was When like objectively was not true for our generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> debt, drugs, alcohol, anger, pornography, sex, or even food offends God. If Until I that. would have heard food addiction offends God, as a believing Mormon, that would have fucked me up. Oh, yeah. I just feel like shame is what also keeps addiction going. <laughs> so he's this, not helping. Like, this is just shame. does sound like someone who was born, like, a hundred years ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, that is really old. Like, who could expect anyone to have updated their operating system as much as it would require to be kind of, like, abreast in this moment? Because your obsession becomes your god. It's also ironic because he is literally like the main guy. <laughs> yeah, you need to be obsessed with me, 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 me. My fabulous God. If you struggle with an addiction, seek the spiritual and professional help you need. It's not going to help people saying God is offended by your thing that you, they already feel like shit for doing because of that belief that they already hold. And it's just this idea that like, oh, well, if you really loved God, you wouldn't have a food addiction. And right. it's like food addiction is like an actual wiring thing that is like your brain has undergone a lot of the time. It's not as simple as like, just say no. It's like kind of like the myth of willpower, which we're realizing is bullshit. You can't just like instantly rewire your brain by loving God. But I guess they do believe that you can. Right? <laughs> and if it doesn't work, well, that's just God of the gaps, baby. <laughs> God of the gaps. He's just off to the gap. <laughs> God has a gap. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the line they've come out with this year. God's in my gap. <laughs> what were these gaps in your resume? Oh, that was when I left humanity for 2,000 years after they crucified me, and then I was like, y'all can do it with your own shit. I kind of did a God of the gaps thing. <laughs> it was really good for me. Please do not let an obsession rob you of your freedom to follow God's fabulous plan. That is the third time you said fabulous. You think you're helping, but you're not. Like, this is just a shame-based message. It's all he's saying is like, by just simply thinking this thing enough, you'll be cured of your addictions. Like it's, com he is a heart surgeon. He's completely delusional about addiction. Yeah, it's amazing. Like you're, we're, we were literally just conditioned to be like, oh, uh, an old man who is speaking with a cadence and intonation that we have, you know, been conditioned to associate with wisdom and love. But when you actually get down to it, I'm not, I'm not like, wow, that is a person who is consumed by I love. Know. I am I like, know. I have been transformed by the power of his, like his divinity, the divinity radiant, this radiating from him. This is the highest vision for Mormons. That's what's so sad. You too could be like this retired heart surgeon, full of shame. <laughs> <laughs> But 99. Thinking selection will also help you obey the law of chastity. I can tell you that it won't. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. Again, mm, sex is only going to be so had in the celestial kingdom. <laughs> and can you have too much celestial kingdom? Riddle me that. Few things will complicate your life more quickly than violating this divine law. If you're a woman and this is the system that will that you'll be in. I don't think so. You can just get a revelation that a sword, an angel with a sword has appeared and asks you to marry somebody else's wife. Just send them on a mission, on a mission willy nilly. It's not that bad, Russell. I mean, that's, that's fine if you're a man, but if you're a woman, well, you can just be a servant. Yeah. <laughs> For you who have made covenants with God, immorality is one of the quickest ways to lose your testimony. It's Why? Not, though. It's Why? Not, though, because people generally cling harder to their religion when they feel shame, unless they feel like it's just such an impossible thing to come back from. This guy, I'm like, he's just <clears throat> making these uh, connections that just like do not exist. If you know something, actually know something, like, you know, I know that with some degree of certainty, okay, that I will see the sun, you know, the sun will be around tomorrow, it will be visible tomorrow. That's not gonna go away because I had sex, right? If I know that uh, any kind of confidence that I may have about yeah. the world doesn't get shattered just because I have sex, if your belief that Mormonism is true goes away because you had sex, it's because you were like, oh, that wasn't actually bad. I've been carrying all this totally unnecessary guilt my whole life <clears throat> that has been used to manipulate me on, the ba on behalf of a multi-billion dollar real estate development company posing as a religion, then yeah, I could see how having sex could destroy your testimony. But really that statement just serves the function of making members 
cast doubt. It just poisons the well of anyone who leaves the church. Well, they probably broke the law of chastity and that's why. Like they always try to paint. Sin is like the main reason that people are leaving. Even now, like after, like there's been research done on this at this point. We know through multiple studies and like whatever that it's not the main reason that people are leaving, but they cannot let it go because if they do, then they have to start taking seriously people's reasons instead of being like, but they're secondary. It's obviously sin, right? Mm -hmm. Again, sexual control is one of the primary manipulation tactics of almost every high demand group. I shouldn't say almost every, that's pretty intense, but because it is, because it's such a basic human impulse and such an integral part of so like most people's human experience. I know there's asexual people and all that, but because it is so central to this, that if you can control that, you can control people. And I actually don't believe that the church you know, the unconscious entity that is the church, I don't think it actually thinks that people can transcend on on huge scale that ability because they don't. People are always going to keep being sexually messy yeah, and following those energies data. and watching porn. They'll keep masturbating because the ch- and then the church will keep using that to create mm-hmm. shame, which yeah, you will... You don't actually want people to suddenly get really no, good at the it's their chastity. it's their mill. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Actually, let's be real. We both left the church, and I feel like the uh, we're not uh, unique in like kind of the way we were. Well, we were people that never would have broke the law of chastity. No, like I don't think it's those people that. I mean, all types of people are leaving the church at this point because it's just not true, and the information is everywhere. But it's like if you were in a state where you had broken the law of chastity, like even with uh, smaller sins, when I was going through my faith crisis. I would be like, oh, well, I can't even trust anything I'm thinking or feeling right now because of that. So I have to like get that sorted. But, and that's how a lot of people are. They're like, you can't, it's hard to like leave a high control group in the middle of a repentance process. Cause Mm -hmm. then you're going to feel like, well, that was just Satan trying to get at me. Or like, I don't know. I just, again, it's like just the false narrative. We did a whole video debunking um, false narratives about ex-Mormons earlier this year, by the way. And it is worth a watch if you haven't seen it already. It really is a lot of the most faithful, obedient people that are leaving because they're the ones learning more and seeing that things don't add up and they care enough to find out one way or the other, which isn't as true for like more cultural moments. Again, there's been no substance to this message. It's just been like, be afraid or else. It's also just like being- Just think celestial dissociate (laughs) and you'll get- what the right thing is, do the right thing. You'll get this promise in the future that you can never actually hold me to because you don't know you'll be dead and it'll be too late to call my bluff if I'm wrong. He's like, and I'll still be alive. (laughs) Dancing on your grave. Many of the adversary's most relentless temptations involve violations of moral purity. The power to create life is the one privilege of godhood that Heavenly Father allows his mortal children to exercise. It's like we literally invented spaceship. (laughs) (laughs) The iPhone, which many are people call many prophets are calling the modern seer stone. (laughs) Physical intimacy is only for a man and a woman who are married to each other. And that's just been true since Adam and Eve, the first couple that ever went to their local courthouse and got a notary. Much of the world does not believe this, but public opinion is not the arbiter of truth. I am. (laughs) Unless you've got to change the temple ceremony because no one's coming because all your death oaths are too weird or something like that. Sometimes it can be the arbiter of truth. We are the arbiter of truth, and we know that gender is... God made a little fleshy person out of clay, out of the dust of the earth, from whence he took a rib, Mm -hmm. created a new woman, and then those became our first parents. They got married in the notary. They had their certificate. It's a real marriage. And then their kids? Pop fucked each other and then populated the world through incest. And that is true. You can take it to the bank. (laughs) Bit of incest doesn't defile. No, and that is that was as true of Adam and Eve as it was of Joseph Brigham, John Taylor, and the rest. Sorry, but you cannot say that Adam and Eve is not like even if you're Mormon and they don't emphasize Adam and Eve like in quite the same way as everyone, they still do. Like Adam and Eve is a big part of the Mormon plan of salvation, right? And I'm like, God's you described God's plan as completely perfect and it literally involved like siblings having sex with each other which is just objectively not perfect no by anyone less than ideal god there's just so many things like that yeah or like he just he had to commit a genocide against those people he had to do it he had to wipe them all out can you imagine perfect. a third of your kids are like we don't want to deal with this this is it and he's like get out get out get out get out I'm 
out. <laughs> and then you, and then the kids who did stay, you let them go to Earth, and they have such a bad time that you have to drown all of them. Imagine the embarrassment <laughs> of having to do that while all the other spirits are like, "Nice you one, know God." He, did so like that. he was like, "No, no, no, this is gonna be sick." He was like, "Oh, the ones who stayed were so bad that you still had to drown them." <laughs> like, what? Like Great this. plan, guy. It's kind of like on Bake Off when everyone's failing the technical. You're like, maybe the problem is you. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe they're not getting enough time, yeah. Paul Hollywood. It's hard to put it on them at a certain point. <laughs> the Lord has declared that no unchaste person will attain the celestial kingdom. Unless you're Joseph Smith. <laughs> and then he just had different to do rules that. It's a whole count. different criteria. Up. So when you make decisions regarding morality, please think celestial. And if you have been unchaste, I plead with you to repent. Come unto Christ and receive his promise of- You know that there's like thousands of people around the world at this moment like sobbing like, oh my God, because oh. they like recently got a hand job. A thousand teenagers oh. who have just been- oh, Bless them. It's, it's so sad because it could, it's as simple as being like, are you being honest with the people you're being intimate with? Are you mm -hmm. being careful? Are you being safe? Are you expressing your needs and desires? Affects, affects some man. Are you treating them with gentleness? Are you being inquisitive about their understandings and desires? Like- mm -hmm. Not just like, oh, all these things are bad. You don't even have to do that in a marriage. That's no. what's so cool. <laughs> you you consent with one single word, and that is yes mm -hmm. in the temple, and then... Yep, and then it's just one big yes and forever. <laughs> but no fun yes, business. Yes, and another child. <laughs> As you think celestial, you will view trials and opposition in a new light. When someone you love attacks truth... We go faster. When this He's talking about um, us right here. Yep. When someone, when someone we love, you love attacks truth, let's see what he's got to say about us. I'm bumping up to 150. Think celestial and don't question your testimony. The Apostle Paul prophesied that in the latter times... Sorry, but I just watched this and I'm like, he's talking about like the people that uh, say negative things about the church, whatever. And I'm like, this is the leader of this organization. This is the, the star, the main guy. And I'm looking at this as some like uh, mediocre YouTuber. And I'm like, I'm so much better at this than you. Like, you are not <laughs> gonna win this fight. Like if this is the advice you're giving people to combat like the type of, and I'm not the best one at doing it. Like I'm like, again, We're only like the 60,000th most popular YouTube channel. Top six, baby, in oh, ex-Mormonism, according to the Mormons, I'm just kidding. And how could he compete with us? He's 99. I mean, he can compete through like conditioning and fear and shit, you know, the yeah. structure that all this is. But in terms of like, I'm just imagining like a, a TikTok I might make about, uh, I don't know, whatever, like shame in Mormonism or whatever, and like how in depth it will, compared to this, like this is so shallow mm -hmm. that I'm like, no reasonable person would put those side by side and be like, yeah, this guy's saying the more substantial, worthwhile thing. Mm -hmm. And again, I am just some guy. There are like thousands of people doing this now. This church is like so dead in the water. It's insane. Again, just change this, pretend he is the president of Jehovah Witnesses or a Scientologist or anything. His message is completely just fear-based and manipulative. There's not anything yeah. like positive or groundbreaking or insightful. It's all just like be obedient, more commitment or else. Their organization has like ne not been honest about their own history, about their own personal experiences, always like softly alluding to their unmistakable witnesses while you know letting mm -hmm. people believe that they have this special connection that they don't really have. Some shall depart from the faith. Again, like every, every Christian faith, every Christian congregation can use that exact verse to encourage people not to leave mm -hmm. or listen to people who have left their congregations or to shut down those who are criticizing the church for, say, child sex abuse cover-up scandals, which seems to be rife in the Christian community these yeah, days. Is, was it thinking celestial that made the church protect abusers? Or should they have thought celestial? That yep. Oh, when Kirk and Kirk really McConkie say. signed off, they just think celestial. Mm -hmm. I don't care about the real people involved. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Slash our devils, own baby. history books. There is no end to the adversary's deceptions. Please be prepared. God's plan didn't involve Satan in the beginning, right? God mm. pitched a plan, mm. and then Lucifer was like, eh, 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 mm -hmm. I'm out of here. They left, came to Earth, and then God was like, I guess you can just lead them into hell forever. That seems like something. You can squat on Earth and lead the rest of them to yeah, hell. Yeah, if you wanted mind. to get back at him, wouldn't you just not let him get involved? Make them, send them to Venus or something, or to Jupiter to get more stupider, mm -hmm. right? Like, 
being like, oh, the adversary is going to endlessly deceive you. It's like, why did God let that happen? That wasn't part of the original pitch. Why did we have to go through that? Didn't he get cast out and you're just going to let him have his way? Why? That's so ridiculous. Unless he was part of the whole plan, the plan for the first place, in which case you can't blame him. Yeah. Ah, no, it's, it's a fucking stupid plan. It <laughs> cannot be overstated how stupid it is. And on and. Now, just living in the age of storytelling where everyone has the power to tell stories and we see so much good storytelling constantly and bad, it, religions just look dumber and dumber because I'm like, just your foundational story, even if true, is still just so stupid and like, doesn't it really inspire me much? It still would just be like, oh, that's really weird. If the whole point of this is just that, like... That's fucked up. Like, it just doesn't have any, like, appeal. For being so fabulous and so clear, it certainly has a lot of holes, which is why you're constantly having to tell people not to listen to those who have left mm-hmm. who are telling the truth about it. You have to brand things as anti-Mormon uh-huh. literature when it's, like, literally just your own history. Like, if your spiritual ideas are good, like, they just, like, stand on their own as well. Like, you don't need to be defending some guy at any point. Truth can always bear investigation, right? There's no Mm. amount of skeptical thought which will ultimately lead you away from the truth, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're able to think skeptically and rationally enough and uh, investigate enough evidence, you'll have at least an emerging, better emerging picture of what reality is. Whereas he's just saying, I'm, 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 turn it off, just think celestial, just think celestial. No, 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 you're just trying to lead me away, you're trying to deceive me, but I, it looks very convincing. I oh, was Satan. Yeah. You literally cannot engage in rational thought if you start with the end in mind. Like, that's the exa- that's why they teach that, because, yeah, any rational investigation of Mormonism is like, obviously these claims are not true. Never take counsel from those who do not believe. Pretty insane thing to say. The history we don't want to acknowledge is coming back to bite us. Our cover-up of child sexual abuse is coming back to bite us. People are actually holding us to the things that we've said? They're actually wanting us to take accountability for the wrong that we've done? Think of a more generous, even a, a more generous interpretation or like idea of Christianity as like all of us were the body of Christ and mm-hmm. who is the foot to tell the hand that it's better or the eye to say I'm more important than the mouth or, you know, whatever those things. And it's so easy to see as someone who's looked into church history, the ways that the church in the ways that it has improved has been through direct opposition, has been through being held accountable by people on the outside, by people who have left and who are speaking up about it. That's how all progress happens as a result of criticism of former ideas, practices, and institutions. That's how everything has grown from uh, from its earlier forms. And so it's like, yeah, if people are like outside of the church, they're just as important as the people in it, and like we're all just part of this process. And to be like, Ooh, that that part happening. of the body is very bad, and Everyone. don't take any feedback, don't listen to any uh, signals from that part of the body. Seek guidance from voices you can trust, from prophets, seers, and revelators, and from the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. Name one time you've seen or revealed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally, what have you seen? What kind of visions have you had? Tell us about it. Of the afterlife? Doesn't sound like it. It all just sounds so mm-hmm. artif- like cardboard, car- painted cardboard surface level mm-hmm. stuff. There's no depth. You're not like expounding the mysteries. You haven't like convinced me at all that you have any more insight than any other 99 year old man. The whole Bonner. point of this church is supposed to be that it's like ever evolving because they have the, the power of open. revelation. This is bullshit. The angels Anyone, have returned. Any bozo in any ward could give this talk. Any and of honestly, any a more compelling one. Who will show unto you the things what ye should do. Can we talk about the whisperings of the Holy Ghost real quick and the neurological uh, studies that were con- conducted here in Utah at the University of Utah by now Harvard neuroscientist Michael Ferguson, where they put people in an MRI. I've talked about this before. Um, and then Mormons, they put Latter- believing Latter-day Saints in an MRI, scanned their brains, and had them read quotes from church leaders and then push a button when they were feeling the Holy Ghost. And... <clears throat> And what they found was that the Holy Ghost is the part of the brain that is also lit up by gambling, drugs, sex, and all these things. So he's kind of setting himself up as the competitor for mm-hmm. these, Which this, I guess these he same is. impulses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he just wants to be the only addiction you're able to... He wants the monopoly on, on your cognitive market. But the thing about this study that was so interesting, they were supposed to click... When they felt the Holy Ghost, they were reading uh, quotes from church leaders and quotes from various Christian people, like Desmond Tutu, um, you know, people Mm -hmm. like that. 
And um, they, most of the Latter-day Saints felt the Holy Ghost when they were reading quotes that were by the leaders of their own in-group, prophets, seers, and revelators. When they're talking, that's when I feel mm. the Holy Ghost. What they didn't know is that all of the quotes were by C.S. Lewis, revealing a cognitive bias Whoa. for in-group authority. Yeah. Cool. Which is his whole shtick. <laughs> C.S. Lewis does slap. Yeah. And so it's really, it's like when you think uh, you're witnessing a person mm-hmm. that you trust to be an authority, yeah, you'll have a, a stronger mental emotional <coughs> reaction to that. And that's consistent across <coughs> all religions. And they may call it by different names. And the Christians themselves, like evangelicals, they, they don't think they're not experiencing the Holy Ghost. They don't look at Mormons and they're like, oh, you have a unique experience that I've never witnessed before. They're like, I have the Holy Ghost. You're a mm-hmm. worshiper of Satan. Mm-hmm. Please do the spiritual work to increase your capacity to receive personal revelation. As you think celestial, your faith will increase. I hate the drive to revelation because I wanted revelation so bad, but I guess I don't have the neural hardware it takes to have hallucinations. (laughs) I just could never summon them. You really deserved a revelation. Now I'm grateful because I'm like, oh my God, if I had started having visions or some shit, that would have been hell, that would have been really bad. When I was a young intern, my income was $15 a month. One night, my wife, Dancel, asked me if I were paying tithing on that meager stipend. Okay, but this was in what, like 1920? You could buy a house with that. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Also, your wife asked you if you paid tithing on that. Why? Wouldn't that already be established that you pay tithing on that? She's like, honey. Did you not talk about finances before you got married? (laughs) That was not thinking celestial, Russ. (laughs) I was not. I quickly repented and began paying the additional $1.50 in monthly tithing. That's like actually quite intense. Like imagine now finding out that someone just decided to not pay tithing. That would be huge. And he still became the prophet. Was the church any different because we increased our tithing? Of course not. However, becoming a full tithe payer changed me. That's when I learned that paying tithing is all about faith. Uh, again, this it's is so all... basic. It's like beyond basic. This beyond whole... basic. Again, this is this was Chat all GPT a manipulation thing a talk. to solicit donations. Imagine if we were sitting here this whole time and being like, "The only way you can be happy in this life is to watch this channel. Don't listen to anyone who says we're bad. Don't listen to anyone who wants to criticize you and distract you from what we're offering you. Yeah. Send us your money now. If you don't send us ten percent of your income." You too will burn alive at the second coming and be separated from your family forever. Close quote. As a full tithe payer, the windows of heaven began to open for me. I attribute several subsequent professional opportunities to our faithful payment of tithes. Why? Correlation equals causation? It was on your mind, therefore? Mm, two things are related to my if, brain for no if reason. If you're a white man who's getting presumably the medical training necessary to be an intern, like you probably often get a job from the internship back then. Do you know mm. what I mean? This is all just like superstitious thinking at its <clears throat> most manipulative. Yeah. Not most manipulative. And There's some like real psychopaths out there. And it also builds faith in God and his son, Jesus Christ. Choosing to live a virtuous life in a sexualized, politicized world builds faith. In a sexualized, politicized like, we've world. We've always had the same impulses for sex. Like we have wiring from like hundreds of thousands of years ago yeah all, look everything in the world is <laughs> fucking all the time it's how it's how it's all it's, i know happened. it's literally how evolu- <laughs> yeah every animal is <laughs> yep um and also i mean obvious point but they are the ones that sexual over sexualize women's bodies spending more time in the temple builds faith and your service and worship in the temple will help you to think celestial Oh, yeah, you won't have to think about anything else when you're in our special castle. There you are shown how to progress toward a celestial life. There you are drawn closer to the Savior and given greater access to his power. There you are guided. What does that look like? Does that look like being able to confront new information, confront and integrate new information better and faster? Does it mean expanding your circle of compassion to ultimately encompass all conscious beings? Does it include uh, uh, being an active political participant, knowing that the intersections of powers is the way that we can effectively help people's lives who are being exploited and manipulated by more powerful people and what like it's what does he more want more moment, more it's moment. just going to the temple more so that you can think about just life more after this obsessed, more obsessed more obedient die now <laughs> in solving the problems 
in your life, even your most perplexing problems. The ordinances and covenants of the temple are of eternal significance. Notice how he goes immediately from tithing to temple. Oh, it's also close. It's very smart to kind of embed the tithing message. The temple, I mean, the temple as a business, Mormonism really is smart. And they've got a lot of smart businessmen running the show. You know, Jesus's favorite demographic right up there with lawyers and uh, religious leaders. (laughs) Uh, But... They, they've, they've got a really solid biz, business plan. It's sort of like this Disneyland religion mm-hmm. where they have a place that people can go to. A really, at least superficially nice place where you're like, ooh, some money went into this and I belong here. Therefore, and of course, I can't like, wander exclusive. around or make myself home or have a good laugh. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you got to be very particular and wear a certain set of mm-hmm. uh, Keebler Elf cult clothing. Which you buy but, from them. Which you buy from Yeah, you have to, your underwear you do have to purchase from them too, of course. Um, I was not cynical enough when I first left the church, or even for many years, to think that they would actually like have the prophet mention tithing because like tithing numbers are down. Like I still kind of maintained this naivety about how like, no, this isn't all about money for them. But then I'm like, well, I guess it is though. This is like their annual meeting and there are there is big money going on here and how much how much people are paying tithing affects everything else yes. like all of the uh, and every business wants to see profit year over year so if they're losing tithing that is a problem like Control of people's money, control of yeah. people's sex. And it's just more and more control. Name one thing in this talk that wasn't about control and manipulation. Yeah. We continue to build more temples to make these sacred possibilities become a reality in each of your lives. God's plan was so amazing that all that the the kids who did decide to come here to get tempted by the other kids who were just allowed to run rampant and lead us all to hell, uh, our, the plan was so good that only like 0.0002% of all the people who lived on the earth would ever actually know about the true church. So, that, But they could spend all of their living waking time on God's you know, they're spending their one wild and precious life in this world of mystery and wonder doing dead works for dead people who didn't get the chance to know about the truth. It's a very good plan. Stunning. Is that just it? Yeah, let's, can okay. we be done with this guy? <laughs> ...is directing us to build these temples to help think celestial. So that we can acquire more real estate. The, the amount of available real estate on this globe is shrinking, and literally, to be a dominator of the world, you have to actually control the land, which is why the more real estate that we can build and develop on, the better chance that we have of one day controlling everything. <laughs> I cannot believe this is God's mouthpiece on the earth. Like, that felt... Maybe I'm just out... Like, was it this bad when it was Thomas S. Monson? Oh, uh, Thomas S. Monson never sat right ago? with me. I, I I was naive then too. But in my mind, this is even worse. This is, I didn't think much of him, but that was just so rote, so rote, like more rote than ever. And so like not even trying to hide the fact that it's all about. I, I feel he's kind of, he's definitely bought into his own, his own, he's lost in his own he sauce. He doesn't you know seem I mean? to have like any personality. Well, he's very good at, uh, Threatening people for donations. You, have you forgotten? I just can't Think believe of the that fundraising there. It's gonna. If we could pull those numbers here, man, <laughs> we'd never have to do one more ethical thing in this life. This is his main thing he's saying for six months. And what's the thing? Like donations. when you're struggling, just think about God. If anyone could say that. What's the point of that? You're supposed to be the one that like says stuff that comes from God. <laughs> Satan is endlessly creative in the ways that he's deconstructing Mormonism. But God can never play a single new note. It's yeah. always like, just keep paying your money. Just keep praying, paying, obeying, praying, paying, obeying, praying, Please disconnect. Please make it stop. <laughs> and this is the point where we need to ask you to keep or start paying if you have the means to. We are fundraising to keep the channel going in 2024 and we need your donations. We're fully reliant on donations. How does Unlike this... them. Even if you don't have the means, God will bless you if you support us on Patreon. Even if you can't feed your family, make sure you send us money and God will pour you out a blessing. There there will not even be room enough to receive it. It is so uh, scary how manipulative that is because people in vulnerable situations Mm -hmm. are more likely, when you're feeling frantic Mm -hmm. and scarce, you're more likely to spend money on a whim of something like that. And magical thinking. And magical thinking. I am. That's why poor people buy lottery tickets. Yes, exactly. Exactly. 
poverty lends itself to magical thinking. That's how this whole religion started, Joseph Smith. God. Literally uh, magical uh, thinking. Oh, this is going to be so long to edit and I'm going to have to watch Russell God Nelson again. God bless you. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We hope you have a good holiday season. Just never stop thinking celestially. You know how important it is. Just turn it off 